98. It says in verse 4, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord and King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for He is coming. For He is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness He shall judge the world and the people, the peoples with equity. Let's pray together. Lord, thank You for the reading of Your Word. Thank You that we can sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Jesus, thank You that You came to dwell on this earth. You came to take on flesh. You came born of a virgin. You came here to die for our sins. And You rose again the third day and You ascended to the Father. And one day You're coming again. So as we sing joy to the world, not only joy because of Christmas, but joy because of Your soon coming. And You'll set everything right. Thank You for what we're going to learn from Your Word today. Thank You for how our spirits have been encouraged today. We have been... We have been blessed with the beautiful singing and scripture reading and seeing our missionaries at work in the field. Thank you for the blessing we've received. Thank you now that we can study your word. Lord, we pray a blessing on those who you've sent out to preach the gospel. Thank you, Father, for Steve and Kent and Dave and Daniel and Keith and Dad and, and for all of our missionaries. Lord, we, we just saw this family who was ministering in Mexico. Bless them and their ministry. We thankful for James and Penny and those you are bringing back to the States. We thank you for our military and all those who are serving. Lord, bless each of them and, and encourage them. Now we pray, Lord, you would teach us. We are listening. May you be our teacher. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, praise team. Well, special for Bob and Gwen today to light the uh, Advent candle. It was just a week ago when uh, Gwen had uh, buried her mother. Her mother's with the Lord now, and so that's a special day today for Bob and Gwen to light the unity candle. We've been studying about different songs that we sing, and we've been studying a little bit about those songs. And so our, our series has been, Then Sings My Soul. And so each week we've been looking at a different song. And today our song is Joy to the World. Uh, Joy to the World was written by Isaac Watts. Isaac is known as the father of, of the church hymns. In fact, he wrote over 600 different hymns, many you're familiar with. Marching to Zion, At the Cross, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, Joy to the World, many of the songs that we sing, Isaac Watts wrote. He was born in 1674. He was born to a home in England. His father was a tailor by trade, but he was also a deacon in, in the local church, the Congregationalist Church there in England. In fact, his father many times was, was placed in jail because of his faith. And uh, so he was he raised up in a godly home. He was the first of nine children. And at the age of nine, he had already learned Latin and Greek. I'm 49 and I still ain't learned English, but that's just part of it. By the time he was 13, he had learned French and Hebrew. He loved music and he loved scripture. And so what his desire was, was to elevate the music in the church. And so at the age of 18, young people listen to me, at the age of 18, he was writing one hymn a week for his church. One of our desires is that our young people and our college students and our children are get more involved in our worship. There may be some songwriters right here in this group. There may be some college students who are songwriters or can play an instrument. We'll make room for you. We want to involve you more in our worship. And so at the age of 18, he, one per week he was writing for his church. At the age of 25, he became associate pastor and then went on to pastor and music was always an important part of his life. Joy to the World also involved a couple other guys. Uh, Lil M Mason is the one who arranged the music to Joy to the World. He took from the third guy that we're going to mention, George 
Handel. Uh, you've heard of Handel's Messiah. Uh, the guy who wrote Handel's Messiah, George Handel, actually the music from Messiah was used for Joy to the World by Mr. Mason. Interesting about Mr. Handel, he was born in 1685 and he was very gifted in music. And like some folks here, the, the guy who plays our organ, Paul, used to play in a rock band, okay? And then uh, he gave his life to Christ, and now he plays for the Lord. Sometimes if you'll listen, you'll hear a little bit of rock coming out there, all right? But this is the same way with Handel. He used his gifts for secular. He, he performed in Italy, he performed in orchestras, and, and then in 1737 he became bankrupt. And that's when he began turning to church music. And that's when he wrote The Messiah. And he became blind at the age of 67, but he continued to write uh, arrangements and music that uh, we enjoy today. So joy to the world, as we think about it, we have a lot to celebrate. Christmas is a time of joy. It's a time to celebrate. It's a time to celebrate that Jesus came. And so I want to read you the words, just a little bit of the words that we sang there. Because sometimes we can sing songs and maybe not listen to the words. So I want you to listen to some of the words of Joy to the World. Uh, if it's, it's in your hymnal, if you want to look, it's on page 270. It says, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. We think of His first coming. Uh, they'll be using this tonight in the, in the service. But we think of His first coming in a manger in Bethlehem. It says, Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare Him room, and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks and hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make His blessings flow, for as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love. We're reminded today that Jesus Christ came he came to this earth. He came to give His life for us. And one day He's coming again. If you believe that, say amen. And we need to live our life in light of that. To know that even this day, Jesus Christ could come again. I was saying Merry Christmas to folks after the 8 o'clock service. We had a good group at 8 o'clock this morning. It was cold, and folks came out, and so I was saying Merry Christmas as they left. And one said, well, I'll see you again before Christmas. And I said, well, what if the Lord came back today? This might be the only time. I get to tell you Merry Christmas. So we're remembering that Christ could return. Look in Luke chapter 2. This is going to be our focus passage in our time together. And we're going to look at this passage and be reminded about His first coming, but also about His second coming. Luke chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 8. It will be on the screen. If you didn't happen to bring your Bible, that's okay. We'll provide it for you. There's one there in the pew as well. That you can read. At this time in history, the Jews were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for the one that God had promised. God had promised He was going to send someone to deliver them. All through the history of Israel, there were those who would be the deliverers. We think of Moses. Moses was sent and he delivered them out of Egypt. And they were looking for the Messiah who would deliver them. At this time in their life, there was a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of difficult living because they were under Roman rule. And so they were had to pay taxes. There was a lot of things going on. There was a lot of burden on them. And so they were longing for the Messiah. And from, from the Old Testament writings till Jesus comes, there was many hundreds of years of silence. No revelation from God. Silence waiting for the Messiah to come. So even the Jews, oftentimes when a boy was born into a family, into that small village, maybe they thought maybe he might be the one. Maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the one that, that God has sent. And so they were longing and looking for that Messiah to come. As mankind, we were in great need of someone to come. We were under the curse that came because of Adam's fall. We were all under the curse. We were all lost in our sins. We were all blinded in darkness. We were all deserving of hell. We all needed someone to come. And oh, what a glorious night. I, that's become one of my favorite songs. I appreciate Israel and the praise team and the choir singing that song. Oh, what a glorious night. That night changed our lives. Look in verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. 
The New King James says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Many of us grew up on King James, and we memorized that because we were in Christmas plays, and we, we played the angel, or we played the shepherds, and we memorized that. The New Living Translation starts verse 8 this way. That night. That night. That just stood out to me as I thought about it. I jotted down some things about that night. Oh, what a marvelous night. That night. That night was, was like no other. That night. Uh, that night the Creator who formed all things, Jesus, who, who with the words of His mouth and, and even with His hands formed all things that we know. He even formed Adam and He formed Eve. The Creator came down to dwell with His creation. I have a hard time getting my arms around that and my mind around that, that God, holy God, who created all things, who has always been, who knows all things, who's all-powerful, put Himself in the form of a baby. He took on the form of a servant. He was born to a teenage girl and to a carpenter that didn't have anything. and He, he was born into a, into a world that He created. That night, the Creator came to dwell with His creation. That night, light entered into darkness. We sang about the light, how appropriate that was, because Jesus was the light of the world. That night, the rivers danced, the trees clapped their hands, heaven and nature sang. That night, what a glorious night. That night changed the world. That night, I believe that hell, hell shook and Satan trembled that night. I believe that night was such a marvelous night. That night, joy was proclaimed. Look at verse 9. So there were some shepherds out in the field. They were watching the sheep. And then verse 9, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone round them. And they were greatly afraid. These are men's men. These are hard-working, blisters-on-their-hand men. These are rough men. These are uh, men that we think of are, are just men. And yet they were greatly afraid. There's something about fear before God because God is a holy God. We get this attitude that we can just kind of skip into the presence of God. We can live any kind of life we want to, and, and that's okay with God. God's a holy God. And there should be some awe in us. There should be some repentance and some shame when we sin. Not, not to be proud, proudful of our sin. We should come humbly before God and say, God, I've sinned. They were greatly afraid when they were in the presence of the glory of God. How we need to have some fear about us, about who God is. Some awe. Verse 10, Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now there's the first point in verse 10, all people. The gospel is for all people. Verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace. Goodwill toward men. There's our second point. The gospel brings peace. Verse 15, So it was when the angel had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste. One translation says they ran and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Can you imagine these shepherds coming into Bethlehem? Can you imagine them going from door to door, house to house? It's night time. Most people's asleep, but yet they go knocking on the door. Hey, we're looking for a babe in a manger. Get out of here. Leave me alone. Hey, we're looking for a babe in a manger. Hey, we're looking for a babe in a manger. They'd go throughout that whole town looking for this one that God told them to find. And they found him. Verse 17, When they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. There's the third point. The gospel is to be proclaimed. Verse 18, And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
Then the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. It was told them. Three things I want us to talk about in our time together. And the first thing is the gospel is for all people. That's what it says in the passage. Look in verse 10. This is good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The angel was sent by God with some of the greatest news that's ever been told. This is, this is life-changing news. This is world-changing news. I mean, this is, this is some of the most important news that God could ever share. And so, we expect if, if we were God, we would send that news to somewhere important. We would send it maybe to the palace. We'd tell the king. Or maybe we'd sell it, send it to the temple and tell the priest. Or we'd go to Fox News, right? Or we'd go somewhere. We're somewhere important where everybody would know. And it would be someone important that we would go and tell the news, but not with God. Out of all the people God could choose to tell first, He chooses shepherds. Now you've got to understand shepherds at this time and, and this first century life here. Shepherds, they were almost, in one commentary, it said they would almost be like to us today, homeless people. They would have been the outcasts. They would have been the stinky guys that nobody invited to the birthday party. I mean, they would have been the guys who weren't even invited into the temple. They were seen as unclean because they were around stinky animals. Now, here's a little insight. God compares you to sheep, okay? Just a little insight. Uh, and He compares me to, I'm supposed to be a shepherd. And so sheep and shepherds were the low, lowly people. They were the forgotten. They were the ones who, who people avoided. And yet God chose to tell these guys this life-changing news. Why did God pick shepherds to be the ones to tell? I think what He's doing in this passage is He's teaching us what He means when He says, all people. The gospel is for all people. If you believe that, say amen with me. Amen? It's for all people. Look in Matthew. Look in the Great Commission. Look in Matthew chapter 28. This was a very unlikely group for God to send an angel to. They weren't expecting it. I'm sure that a lot of people wouldn't have expected this to be who God would give this great news to, but He chose shepherds. In Matthew 28, it's the Great Commission... Some of Jesus' last words before He ascends. This is after His death, after His burial and His resurrection. He spent some time with the disciples. And now He's ascending to the Father. And here's what He says to them. He says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority. Two weeks ago, my outline for today was this. It was all people, all power, all possible. That was my outline until God changed me. But that was, looking here, God, Jesus has all power. He has all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of America. Ba is that what yours says? Oh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the ones in Tennessee. Is that what it says? Go and make disciples of the people that look like me, dress like me. No. Go and make disciples, what does it say, church, of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Revelation talks about at the end of time, when we all, those of us who are believers, when we are in the presence of God in heaven, it says that when we're singing praises to God, that every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every kindred, every people group, will be represented. The gospel, he came to the shepherds with the gospel because he wanted the church to always be reminded the gospel is for the lowliest of the lowly, it's for the outcast, it's for the, it's for the king, and it's for the beggar. It's for all people. All people. We're to share the gospel with all people. You have a new neighbor that moves in, and maybe they're a Muslim. Guess what? The gospel's for them. Amen? I mean, the whole refuge issue is a big deal. We read about it and we, we watch about it on TV and we've all got our political opinions. And I ain't even talking about political opinions. What I'm saying is, whoever is in our path, whether they're refuge or not, 
They are here and they need Jesus. And the gospel's for them. In your, if you did your reading for missionaries this week, one of them was about a guy who's on the Syrian border. And he's there sharing the love of Christ with refugees who are losing their homes, who are being, who are being sent away. I thank God for our missionaries who are out sharing the gospel. And whether they're here or whether in a different country, like in Mexico we watched, they're all people are to hear the gospel. That's right. All people. I like it when you hear amen. Isn't that little? Isn't that great? Amen. All people. It doesn't matter. The gospel is for all people. The gospel's for the drunk. The gospel's for the CEO. The gospel's for the homosexual. The gospel's for the, for the preacher's wife. The gospel's for everybody. The gospel's for that teenager who's got more earrings in every part of their body. They're still part of all people. Your neighbor, your co-worker, the people you go to school with, they're in that all people. The gospel is for all people. And we're to be sharing the gospel with all of these people. He came to the shepherds. Go back to Luke chapter 2. He came to the shepherds and he was teaching us the gospel is for all people. The you there in the passage in verse 11 is plural. For there is born to you, not just the Jews, but to Gentiles and to all people. This is for you. He came for you. I think he also chose shepherds because he was teaching us something about him. Jesus over in John chapter 10 said, I am the good shepherd. I, I will lay down my life for the sheep. I think he came to shepherds because shepherds after his own heart. Shepherds would gather up the sheep at night into the sheepfold. Maybe they had bales of hay and they made a circle and then there was one entrance that all the sheep would go in. And then the shepherd, he would lay down in the doorway. If you got to the sheep, you had to come through the shepherd. And so there was the shepherd. He would lay down his life for the sheep. If the wolves came trying to get the sheep, the shepherd was there. And that's what Jesus says to us. I'm going to lay down my life for you. I give my life for you on the cross so that you can be forgiven, so you can be saved, so you can have a relationship with God. I lay down my life for you. Jesus also says not only to say I'm the good shepherd, He says I'm the door. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus. Amen? Only one way. I don't care what the political opinion is. I don't care what society says. God's Word is true, and we'll always believe God's Word. He says that's the only way to get there. It's through Jesus. And so He's the door, He's the good shepherd, and He says, that's some of the reason why I came to shepherds, because they're after my own heart. For those who are preachers in here, we've got a bunch that we, we've sent out, and we're thankful for Brian and Amanda and one church, and what God's going to be doing there starting in January, and the great ministry, and as shepherds, Brian and I and Steve and, and all of us who are preachers, we're called to be shepherds. It's really interesting as a pastor. Because here's the way it is. He says to pastors, Okay, this is my bride. You're the bride of Christ. You are believers. You're the bride of Christ. So he says to pastors, he says to Brian, he says to me, he says to Steve, he says, Hey, I want you to take care of my bride till I come get her. That's a pretty big responsibility, let me tell you. Take care of my bride. He says, to, he says we're like sheep, and he says to Brian and I and Steve, and he says, you're, you're like shepherds. You're the under-shepherd. These are my flock. And so a good under-shepherd will guide you and care for you and, and, and take you to water and feed you good word of God and, and will protect you from the wolves. And sometimes he has to take the rod and kind of nudge you a little bit the way you need to go. And So that's what shepherds are. So Jesus says, I, I want the good news to go to shepherds first. Because Jesus said, shepherd, I'm the good shepherd. And shepherds are those who are low of the low, and the gospel is for all people. Now, last of all about shepherds, I think he came to shepherds because Jesus also came to be the Lamb of God. He came to give his life for us. These shepherds outside of Bethlehem, probably were watching over some of the sheep and the lambs who would be killed at the Passover. And so Jesus came, the angel came to these shepherds who were watching over lambs who were going to be killed. And God saying, Jesus is the Lamb of God who came to die for us. 
Luke chapter 2. Look at the second thing. Not only is the gospel for all people, but second of all, the gospel brings peace. The angels told them not to be afraid. The shepherds were greatly afraid. What was going on? The holiness of God in their presence, and they were greatly afraid. We live right now in a society where there is a lot of fear. There's a lot of chaos. Every time I look on Twitter, there's a new shooting. California, Colorado, Chad, Paris. We, we see all of these shootings. We see terrorism. We see, we see all that's on the, the news and we look at the paper and we, we see what's happening across this world and it's so easy to be like the shepherds and be greatly afraid. To live in fear. Well, let me encourage you. We are not to be a people that's living in fear. We are to be a people who trust God and instead of fear, we have faith. Instead of panic, we have peace. The peace of God that He's granted us. He says here, the gospel gives you peace. Don't be afraid. Moms and dads, you've got kids. Don't let them see fear in you. Let them see in you. Son, we're going to trust God. Daughter, we're going to trust God. We're not going to fear what terrorists can do. We're not going to fear what man can do. We're not going to fear what the enemy can do. Because God is greater than he that is in the world. Amen? God's greater. He's got this. Man, I'm learning this more and more. At 49 years old, me and Jen are learning more and more. God's got this. I ain't going to worry about it. I ain't going to be afraid. I'm going to trust God. Our kids and our grandkids need to see us. Our people that have a peace. Christmas is all about peace and about joy. It says we got great news. Good tidings of great joy. He goes on to say that, that God's bringing peace. When Jesus came, He reconciled us who were enemies with God. He reconciled us to God, and now we have peace with God. And now we have a peace in our heart. Isaiah 26.3 is one of my favorite verses. He will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on Him because you trust Him. God says, I will keep you in perfect peace if your mind's on Me and you trust Me. Church, we can have perfect peace in our hearts. Even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of, of marriage struggles, even in the midst of financial troubles, even in the midst of, of sickness and, and wayward kids and, and all this chaos. If we set our minds on God and we trust Him, He'll grant us peace. For those who are here lost today, God will grant you joy and peace when you come and embrace Jesus and the cross, and you come with a, re a repentive confession that you're a sinner and you need Christ to forgive you, and you will bring peace and joy into your hearts. I'm so thankful for the peace and joy that He has granted us. Joy is something that no one else can take away. Joy is not based on circumstances. Joy is based on Christ. It's not based on what's going on in our life. Joy comes from God and knowing that He's in control and that Jesus has granted us joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit that He's given us. Let us celebrate with the shepherds that Christ has come to bring peace and joy in our lives. The third thing, look back in your passage in Luke chapter 2, look at verse 17. The third thing is that the gospel is to be proclaimed. The shepherds went about telling everybody what they had saw and what they had heard. Here's the cool part of this story. The angels told them the good news, and then the shepherds told everybody else the good news. They took the place of the angels. You see, when someone shares the gospel with you, now the way it's supposed to work is that you step into their role, and you tell the gospel to somebody else. There should be an obligation for us that we're going to share the good news of this peace and joy that Jesus can give us. We're going to share it with someone else. Because they're living in fear. They're in fear of death. They're in fear of hell. Of hell. They're in fear. They're living in sin. They're living broken. They're living empty. They're living in darkness, separated from God. And we ought to be obligated to share with them what we know. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to go to seminary. You just tell them what you know, what you've seen. Jesus saved me. And He changed my life. He gave me peace and joy. My marriage is different. My family's different. My whole look, outlook's different. My future's different. i got heaven now. Just tell what you know. Jesus can change your life. And that's 
What I want to encourage you during this Christmas season is proclaim the gospel. They went about telling others about Jesus. The shepherds, when they left here, it says in verse 20, they returned. They went back to the same flocks. They went back to the same fellow shepherds. They went back to the same wives. They went back to the same kids. They went back to the same homes. When they went back, they went to the same job. But I bet you money it was a lot different. It says they were praising and worshiping. You know why their marriage was different? It's because they were different. I do counseling a lot. Uh, what I try to help folks understand, if you let God change you, it'll change your marriage. You see, what happens in our marriages sometimes, we want to try and change our husband, or we want to try and change our wife, and God's all the time sitting up here saying, hey, look in the mirror, it's you. Why don't you change? Let God change you, and if you change, then it'll change the marriage. And if they want to be an idiot and keep going the wrong way, then that's where they're going. But you've changed, and you're going to change how things are because you've changed your attitude. You hate your job wherever you work, you hate it, if you would let God change you and your attitude, work's going to be a whole lot different because you've been changed. They were changed because of Jesus. Let God bring a change in our life. We, this is what we can control. It's change us. You don't get along with your mom and dad? What if you changed you instead of trying to change your parents? What if you became obedient to your parents? What if you honored your parents? What if you said to God, God, help me be who I need to be? Home's going to be different. Things are going to be different. I'm just telling you, I mean, if we can change, let God change us, things will change. During the Christmas season, may you be like the shepherds, and may you proclaim the gospel. When you go to lunch today, when you're out shopping and you're standing in line, I, I, Jen's not, she was at the 8 o'clock service, but I'll tell you what, she, she texted me, Friday. I was in a meeting that morning and she texted me and it was four texts and it went like this. Can you come to Walmart? Second text. Go to my car. Find my gun. Wow. Third text. Come find me in the store. Fourth text. Shoot me. That was her text. That was it. Okay. Anybody felt like that? Uh, you know, that's the way it is. You know, when you're out there and you're in line and, you know, people are rude and may you, as you leave each day going to work and school, may you say, God, help me that I will look for opportunities to share the gospel today. That I will see those people who used to drive me crazy. May I see them as people who need the gospel. And may during this Christmas season, we recognize in this passage, the gospel is for all people. The gospel brings peace, and the gospel needs to be proclaimed. And we are the people to do that. We are the people to join our missionaries and to, to proclaim the gospel to wherever it is we live and where we work. Stand with me for prayer. Heads are bowed. In just a moment, Israel's going to play. As your heads are bowed, if you're here and you're lost today, Jesus Christ loves you and He gave His life for you. He came to this earth. The you there is plural and it means you. The gospel's for all people. Would you come and receive Christ today with a repentant embrace? Confess your sins and ask Jesus to forgive you today. You will be granted peace and joy, abundant life and eternal life by coming and putting your faith in Jesus. For believers today, Maybe there's some things going on in your life, some turmoil, and you just need to come and you just say, say, God, would you produce in me the Spirit, through the Spirit, some fruit of peace and joy. Help me to trust you in this. Maybe you need to come and say, God, I want to be a witness at school. I want to be a witness at work. Would you help me that I'll proclaim the gospel? Oh, I pray you would come. Maybe you're here and you've got some prejudice in your heart. And you need to come and confess that to God because the gospel is for all people. We're going to pray you do that. And Lord, thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for decisions already being made. Thank you for you changing our lives. Thank you that we're different in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you can change us and that changes 
the joy that we have is not based on circumstances. It's based on you. Lord, I know there's marriages that are hurting. I know there's families that are hurting. I know there's people who have financial struggles, people who have sickness. Lord, you know the needs of all these people. They're your sheep. You love them. I pray you'd lift a burden off of many of them today. That you would encourage them and you'd help them and you'd strengthen them. And for those who are lost, I pray you'd draw them to you. They'd be saved today. We thank you and we thank you for the peace and the joy that you grant us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Just keep your heads bowed. Folks are coming to pray. You're invited to come.